All right, well, I'm Michelle Fullard. I'm with the University of Colorado, uh, the Department of Neurology. And um, uh, the project that we're working on is called Removing Barriers to Deep Brain Stimulation Surgery for Women with Parkinson's Disease. And uh, right before we looked into funding through the Davis Finney Foundation, um, we had just finished a study looking at um, how many women and men get deep brain stimulation surgery each year. And we found that year after year, women continued to uh, maybe make up 30% of those who were receiving deep brain stimulation surgery. So um, over the past decade or so, it just hadn't changed. So we really wanted to look into why, why women weren't receiving CBS as often. Um, and to see if we could uh, come up with some interventions to help reduce that disparity. So then we came across funding from the Davis Kinney Foundation uh, with the goal to um, improve quality of life for those living with Parkinson's. And so we thought that goal fit in really well with our goals of this study, which really are ultimately to improve quality of life and ensure that deep brain stimulation surgery is available for all those who might qualify. Like I mentioned before, women are less likely to get uh, DBS than men. Um, and so in this study, basically there are two parts. In the first part, we're trying to understand why. So what are the unique barriers that women face when considering DBS surgery? And uh, then we're trying to uh, implement some interventions to reduce this disparity and make sure that women who qualify for DBS um, can actually make an informed decision about whether or not to undergo DBS. Um, so in the first part, we're interviewing about 40 women and men who have gone through the DBS evaluation process and have made a decision about whether or not to undergo DBS. Um, one thing that's unique about our study is that we're including uh, people with Parkinson's who have decided not to undergo DBS. So they haven't really been represented in any of the uh, prior studies that have been done. So through these interviews, um, we're really hoping to understand how people make decisions about their care for Parkinson's. You know, do they have the support they need, the information they need, and what interventions uh, can actually improve the process uh, for women and men with Parkinson's? Um, and then based on the findings from these interviews, uh, so in part two, we are actually adapting and implementing some of these, uh, some of these interventions. So one includes the DBS ambassador program. Um, and so we actually have over 30 people currently who are interested in being these DBS ambassadors, which is exciting. Um, but this is where we'll have um, just, uh, all these uh, people with Parkinson's who have gone through DBS and are willing to speak with others who are considering DBS. And that way people can really get the patient perspective to really understand what is it like to go through the process? What is it like living with CBS? And did it actually do what you hoped it would do? Um, and then second, uh, because we find that women uh, in general are just less supported through the decision-making process, oftentimes aren't given as much information, we are developing this decision support tool uh, that will hopefully you know, provide all the information that uh, women and men need to make this decision. But um, what makes it different than just a booklet of information is that it helps people clarify their goals um, and their values so that they can really make an informed and value-based decision. Um, and we find that in the research that has been done in the past, people who make value-based uh, decisions actually tend to stick with that decision and tend to have much more decision satisfaction in the long run. Well, we're really hoping that if we show that the ambassador program and the decision support tool uh, improve decision outcomes for people with Parkinson's, that uh, we can really expand this to you know, potentially other centers and then uh, to other big therapy decisions for Parkinson's uh, because we wanna make sure that people are getting the information they need and are able to make those informed and value-based decisions. Um, and then again, we also just hope that this will allow all those who potentially qualify for DBS surgery to make that informed decision and to have access to the surgery, which can be life-changing. Uh, well, first, so we have about another year um, in which we are actually implementing uh, the decision aid and the ambassador program. And you know, this does show that it improves decision outcomes for people with Parkinson's who are considering DBS. Then our next step is to try to develop a more interactive and personalized decision support tool so that uh, people with Parkinson's could go to a website, they put in their symptoms, what symptoms they hope DBS would address, 
and then they get a personalized output saying, you know, these symptoms we expect to improve, these ones wouldn't be addressed by DBS. Um, and so then again, that can help with that informed decision um, for a therapy like DBS. Um, so we're hoping to apply for NIH funding um, for a larger randomized controlled trial of this uh, decision aid that's more interactive. Um, and then, you know, I think this is something that could serve as a model for, you know, again, other therapies, other big decisions for people with Parkinson's and probably outside of Parkinson's and just other neurologic diseases as well. So one, I mean, we're obviously very thankful to the Davis Finney Foundation. Um, you've made this research possible. And then um, of course, wanna say thank you to our patients. So we've had over 50 um, who have participated in the research so far. We expect probably another 50 in the next year and we couldn't do this without them. And everybody's been so excited about it. And um, so many have volunteered to be part of the ambassador program. So we really couldn't do this without them. Um, and then um, I've been working with the Center for um, Patient Decision-Making here at CU, and then the neurology department has been really just supportive as 